invite me to dinner at his very nice house. Uh, at his dinner table, there was always a very interesting mix of guests, including, at times, the conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, if you remember. Zubin <laughs> Mehta. Zubin Mehta, yes. Uh, so I've been very grateful to Ambassador Sarwar Nakhvi for his friendship over the years. I'm very glad that on his return to Pakistan, he established uh, his center, which is organizing this event here today. And I've also been privileged to know General Isamulta in the context of a nuclear working group where both of us have been working on trying to facilitate uh, the improvement of international cooperation with regard to civilian nuclear programs uh, in Pakistan. Um, and of course, my two other panelists, Seventh Secretary Hashmi, as well as Brigadier Zahir Kashmi. So my comments here are my personal comments, and they don't represent the views of any organization I am with or was with in the past. I want to put ex nuclear export controls in a slightly broader perspective, and then narrow them down to the nuclear suppliers group, and then the current Pakistani interest uh, in, in joining the nuclear suppliers group. So nuclear supply control has been on the international agenda from the very beginning of the nuclear age. Right after the first nuclear explosion in July 1995, there have been various proposals on how to control the spread of nuclear technology and to find ways of facilitating its use for uh, peaceful purposes. So some of the earlier proposals, you, you will remember the Atchison Lillian Plan, Plan, the Marov Plan, President Eisenhower's uh, speech, uh, Arabs for Peace, uh, in the General Assembly in 1953. All were struggling to find ways and how to make available nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, but minimize its use for nuclear weapons and, and other military purposes. So export controls came about in the 50s and the 60s when the first nuclear transactions were made principally by the United States with its allies in, in Europe and Canada. Uh, and then with the establishment of the European Commission following the Treaty of Rome, as part of the European Commission's uh, trade with nuclear issues, uranium control, uh, all nuclear activities within the European uh, community and the Euratom still is occupying that particular position and Euratom then devised safeguards for the control of uh, civilian nuclear technology within the European community. Uh, the, with the advent of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968, which entered into force in 1970, the responsibility for administering nuclear verification in the case of non-nuclear weapon states party to the NPT, was given to the International Atomic Energy Agency. The treaty did not specify what type of safeguards would be applied. The treaty specified that the safeguards for nuclear verification would be in accordance with the IAEA safeguard system. So it left it up to the IAEA to define what the safeguard system would be. But the treaty itself also specifies that all non-nuclear weapon states are obligated to declare and to place under safeguard their entire uh, spectrum of nuclear activities, nuclear materials, and nuclear facilities. So in order to come up with the technical definition of what is contained in Article 3 of the NPT, one, special fissionable material, this is material that is used for making nuclear weapons, which can only be highly enriched uranium and or plutonium, uh, how would one define it for verification purposes? How would we define this for purposes of an internationally legally binding treaty between a state and an international verification organization? And then Article 3 of the NPT also calls for regulating trade and transfers of equipment, especially designed or prepared for production and handling of special vegetable material. So this relates to controlling transfers of uranium enrichment and plutonium separation technology. These are the only two sensitive parts of the nuclear fuel cycle. And as you know, the nuclear fuel cycle has no difference. You, you enrich uranium, you can enrich it to a certain level, under 5%, normally between 3.1 to 3.67% for running a light water reactor, or you can enrich to somewhere around 40, 45% for running nuclear power ice breakers, like in the Russian icebreaker fleet, or you can enrich the uranium up above 90% for use in nuclear weapons, as well as use in uh, uh, naval nuclear propulsion, fast attack submarines, ballistic missile submarines, and nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carriers. The, the 
process is exactly the same. And sometimes when I'm speaking to students in my class, I, I say it's the same process as using milk to, to churn uh, yogurt or to make cheese and the other end of the spectrum. So that is the challenge of the international verification system that one, uh, that this technology has spread. It is in use in several countries. And how do we verify this cutoff point for use only in civilian purposes? So the very first docu documented description of export controls was made by the Zanger Committee. This was chaired by Professor Claude Sander of uh, Switzerland. It met in Vienna under the aegis of the IAEA. And its mandate was to define uh, the terms used in Article 3 of the NPT for purposes of safeguard verification and what items uh, would need to be safeguarded in terms of when they would be supplied or exported uh, by supply states. So the first trigger list for nuclear export controls was made by uh, the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Sorry, was made by the Zagreb Committee. And then following the shock of 1974, where India uh, used nuclear material diverted from a safeguarded reactor in contravention of exclusively peaceful use commitments given to uh, the governments of Canada uh, and, and the United States. This shock uh, led to a re-examination of uh, nuclear export controls. And then at that time, uh, seven countries, which were uh, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Canada, United States, including Australia as well, uh, they decided that these were the principal suppliers of nuclear material and technology, uh, that they would find a way of how to cope with this challenge, where a country that was not party to the NPT had managed to acquire nuclear technology and expertise and had used it for military or weapons purposes. So as General Hassan pointed out, even though France at that time was not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, it was nonetheless invited to be a member of the then London Suppliers Group as a supplier. The condition of NPT membership did not exist at that time. This came later. Japan was also invited to join the Suppliers Group or the London Club. Japan at that time also was not a member uh, of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, it is sort of interesting that instead of expanding the mandate of the Zagreb Committee, which already had a recognized uh, status in the context of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the IAEA, the Nuclear Suppliers Group met separately at their thought meet in Vienna, which is the United Nations headquarters for all things nuclear in, 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 the, in terms of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Its chairmanship was also changed from a chairman coming from a non-nuclear weapon state, in this case Switzerland, to the chairmanship uh, coming from one of the nuclear weapon states and then to start off with the, the United States. And it also expanded its mandate to include what is known as fuel use items. These are essentially non-nuclear items that have uses in civilian uh, technologies but as well as in nuclear weapons technology. But some of this is very specialized equipment such as high-speed street cameras because you need to capture the explosion, the expansion of the nuclear material and its uh, Fissioning for purposes of evaluating the design of the nuclear weapon after it's been detonated. Uh, other types of timing and fusing mechanisms which are needed to drive the fusing mechanism for a nuclear weapon. Many of these have perfectly legitimate civilian uses, but some of these technologies only have a single use, and that is nuclear weapon use. So this was published in Annex 2 of the Nuclear Supplies Group. By publishing this in Annex 2, it also coincidentally provided a list of critical technologies that a country seeking nuclear weapons would need to acquire. And therefore, it is not surprising that in the clandestine Iraqi nuclear weapon acquisition program that was uh, exposed in 1991 after its military defeat in the first Gulf War, many of the things that appeared on Annex Q of the nuclear supplies group were exactly what the Iraqi nuclear weapon program was chasing up. So I, I mentioned this to say that uh, the nuclear supplies group has a checkered history. In the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference process, this is the sovereign of the NPT states party. This is the only forum where, non where NPT non-nuclear weapon state parties and nuclear weapon states parties meet every five years and agree on the strengthening of the treaty and the overall nuclear non-proliferation mechanism. In the agreed outcome documents, principally of 1995, 2000, and 2010, uh, there is recognition of the utility of export controls because it is mentioned in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. 
There's also recognition of the Zanger Committee because it has a direct connection to the NPP. But there has never been a single mention of the nuclear supplies group as the MSG. So that tells you something. The 48 countries that are members of the NSG do not represent the international nuclear community. This is a self-appointed group, which, because it includes the principal nuclear suppliers, has a particular status in terms of controlling the transfer of nuclear technologies and materials uh, in, in civilian use. Uh, nonetheless, um, in recent years, uh, some people have said that with the exception or exception given to a non NPT state in 2008, this particular action is direct violation of agreed non-proliferation treaty review conference outcomes of 1995 and 2000, where in 1995, the 178 parties to the NPT and in 2000, the 190 parties to the NPT agreed by consensus that all new nuclear supply agreements must require as a condition of supply full scope safeguards. Full scope safeguards means comprehensive safeguards. Comprehensive safeguards can be applied only in non-nuclear weapon states, which means the entirety of the nuclear activity has, is under uh, international verification. Full scope safeguards are not applied in nuclear weapon states. And full scope safeguards are not applied in non NTT states which have item specific safeguards agreements, as has already been pointed out by Ambassador Bakhti in his introductory, uh, uh, in his introductory comments. Uh, so, giving an exemption to a non NTT state without the requirement of full scope safeguards is going against what these 48 countries themselves have agreed in a different forum. So, there already is an inherent contradiction. And if you look at the proceedings of uh, the review conferences after 2005, after the Indian uh, Nuclear Cooperation Agreement with the United States, and from the 2010 review conference, and then in 2015, and even this year in Vienna at the first preparatory committee for the 2020 review conference, several countries from the non-aligned have been very critical of opening up nuclear commerce with non-NPT states. And they have used the term privileged access. They have used the term in a sense of non-NPT states having a more privileged access than NPT non-nuclear weapon states, which already have full scope safeguards. My second point um, relates to the so-called factors that you will find listed on the nuclear supplies group's web page as determining, determining the, the criteria or conditions of factors that the group would take into account for admitting new members. But then when you look at the composition of the group, you have you know, some strange countries like Croatia or Cyprus, I and mean, there's nothing wrong with these countries as such, but they are not nuclear suppliers. They are not transit points. Singapore is a transit point, but not Cyprus or Croatia. So if you look at the map of the nuclear supplies group, this is all northern countries except for Mexico and South Africa. So the bulk of Africa, the bulk of Asia, and many of the South American countries are outside uh, the nuclear supplies. This also, in reality, affects the international power balance. So I remember my South African friends, uh, when South Africa applied for NSG membership, they were given a very, very rough time. South Africans were really upset that with the NSG because they had given up six nuclear weapons that they had manufactured. They had voluntarily dismantled them, joined the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state, invited the IAEA to verify that they had no nuclear weapons. They had put the highly enriched uranium coming out of their nuclear explosive devices under IAEA safeguards. They had the potential to supply enriched uranium. They had the potential to supply uranium enrichment technology. And yet, this nuclear suppliers group was finding excuses for delaying giving them membership, and it took them nearly three years to get access. And that access only came when South Africa finally said, okay, if we don't have get access now, we are going to withdraw our application, and we will do what we need to do in our national interest. Um, you, a country like Pakistan, which is not an NPT state, does not need membership in the NSG if it wanted to sell products in the nuclear market. Of course, it, ha it has a problem in buying from on the nuclear market, but not in selling to the nuclear market. Um, 
the, the next point I want to make with regard to the fact is, is that in the recent discussions following the U.S.-India nuclear cooperation agreement and the 2008 uh, exemption, uh, a lot of think tanks and academics have, have come up with all sorts of different criteria and factors to be taken into account. And this is very much like a Christmas tree. Everything you can shovel into a into a bin is, has been shoveled in there. Um, for me, the only one concern is that with NPT states parties is that they have not taken on an internationally legally binding non-proliferation commitment. So they're not going to sign the NPT, India, Pakistan, Israel, so that's reality. So that's off the table. Uh, but then I don't see these three countries, or at least two of these three countries, taking some other internationally legally binding non-proliferation commitment as an act of good faith of becoming closer to the international community. So one of these could be the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, although this is not a disarmament treaty, it still restricts one element of um, the nuclear weapons potential by taking away nuclear testing, which obviously has implications for modernization of uh, nuclear weapon arsenals. Uh, this, I know, is a sensitive subject uh, in this country, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm just putting it on the table. Other criteria that have been put uh, as part of this discussion is uh, signing up to various international conventions on nuclear safety and security, Security Council Resolution 1540, uh, and a bunch of other things. These are very separate. IAEA member states, as part of their membership in the IAEA, already have, in a sense, um, a responsibility to ensure that their civilian nuclear programs, at least, are according to the highest standards of nuclear safety and nuclear security, as agreed by them themselves in the framework of IAEA uh, guidelines, fundamentals, various goals, and interventions. So that does not necessarily belong in the basket of uh, nuclear export controls or nuclear export control uh, mechanism. Um, nor do, for example, other elements such as um, adherence to other export control regimes. This is on the nuclear field. So there is the missile technology control regime, which is, again, another self-selected uh, control regime. Again, not recognized in terms of legitimacy in international uh, resolutions or international fora. Um, so MPCR is fine for those who want to join for it, but I don't feel it belongs in the discussion on uh, on MSG guidelines. And this is not well known, but I always take some um, um, strange um, delight in mentioning it to each incoming MPCR chairman that we have two members of your MPCR uh, grouping which are engaged in import and export of strategic ballistic missiles. And as you know, the MPCR controls export of uh, missiles which uh, have a capability in excess of 500 kilometers and a uh, payload capacity of 300 kilograms. There is one nuclear weapon state whose submarine launched ballistic missiles are leased from another nuclear weapon state. Uh, it puts its own nuclear warheads uh, on those uh, uh, strategic, uh, submarine, uh, sub strategic missiles, but this is trade between two countries. And if the missile is fired as a test missile, then a payment is made, otherwise there is a fee that is agreed for, so to speak, the rental of these missiles. So this really is transfer because the user, nuclear weapon state, is on its strategic submarine and it's therefore under its jurisdiction and control. Uh, so it's, it's again something that in terms of a small contradiction, but nonetheless is by significant. In another forum, I have discussed the utility now that in the UN framework, what we need to look at a multilateral export control regime. We already have the Chemical Weapons Convention, which entered into force in 1997. We have an organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons. So why do we still need the Australia group? We don't have a global missile control regime, which is why the MTCR is there for some countries, and then they've expanded it into the Hague Court, Hague Court of Conduct, which is more than 100 countries subscribing to it, and I believe Pakistan is this one of them. Uh, then for nuclear export controls, we already have the non-proliferation treaty. There are only four countries that remain outside, but all other countries already have a nuclear export control obligation. Uh, and so, again, if we had a multilateral system which is properly negotiated, then we have more of a buy-in. And then we don't need uh, these unique uh, self-appointed groupings of states controlling different um, 
or having an unreasonable influence. Uh, and finally, um, I was also responsible at the IAEA for the Nuclear Suppliers Group, and every year the chairman will, would come to, to us uh, with the agreed statement and as well as with any agreed um, updates to the two annexes uh, of, of the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which are published at Insert 254, Information Circular. Um, and we always ask them, well, we at the IAEA, we are interested in information on deniers. Denial in terms of inquiries made by countries or companies uh, seeking dual use or other items so that IAEA can match it to see if any of its countries that are under safeguards are seeking to acquire nuclear weapon capability in a clandestine manner, which is illegal under the NPT for non-nuclear weapon states, or they might be acquiring nuclear technology or materials that they are not declaring to the IAEA. And the answer we would always get is, well, the chair of the NSG or the NSG as a group uh, cannot provide such information. Only individual countries can provide that information. So then my reply would be, so why are you in my office? I can go to each of the 48 countries and request that information. You are not providing any service to the IAEA. This, of course, didn't go down well, but it also points to uh, that what is sometimes advertised as the non-proliferation benefit of some mechanisms in practice doesn't always end up uh, being so. Um, finally, the IAEA General Conference in September provides a, a good venue for countries to hold side events uh, as a way of um, having discussions or uh, putting forward uh, what they might have done in improving nuclear safety, security, or in the case of Pakistan, since we are discussing uh, that over here, um, again, to reach a broader audience, uh, inform people who don't know about this issue or people or to remind them of the significant strides that Pakistan has made over the past 10 years or so on its export control legislation and tightening up. Um, uh, it's, it's, and, and the case that it has made, and it's generally believed that uh, if you compare nuclear regulators, the Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Agency has been certified by the IAEA to be an independent regulator. There are still some questions where the PNRA's independence could be further strengthened, but a similar determination has not yet been made of the Indian uh, nuclear regulator. Again, this is something that is not well known. There is a center of excellence now, Pakistan on nuclear security, which is used by the IAEA as uh, a provider of, uh, of nuclear security training in a regional context, and the IAEA Director General visited it, I think it was last year. I mentioned it in an uh, opening statement at the Board of Governors, and that is you do not have a similar equivalent on the other side uh, of the border. So I will stop there.